Okay, let me share the content first for today. <clears throat> Okay, can you guys see the slides? Nampak slides? Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll move on to wafer characterization. We have covered um, uh, wafer preparation before, <clears throat> uh, divided to two parts in our two uh, last, uh, last two classes. So today we're going to move on to wafer characterization. Okay, so let's get a few things before we move on as usual. Uh, let's recall the process steps involved in wafer preparation. How many steps are there in the wafer preparation process? Anyone? You can go back to the <clears throat> previous slides, uh, previous lecture. From the growth, uh, remove seed tail grinding process, uh, marking the orientation, cutting wafers, edge round, uh, lapping to the correct thickness, CMP process, and finally uh, damage removal. Okay. So why sowing is usually associated with high curve loss. How do we minimize curve loss? So how do we minimize curve loss during uh, the cutting process? Thinner wire, yep, very good. Ada lagi, uh, other approach. Thinner wire is obvious, okay. So the thinner you, the thinner the wire you use, then the, the lesser the portion that's going to be wasted. So that's why we call it curve loss. So what's the role of CMP process during wafer preparation? Why do we have CMP? We get the name there. Why do we do CMP? Polishing, yep. <clears throat> Smoothing surface, yes. Removing defects, okay. So, uh, so those are the things. Remove surface materials, yes. Very good. Okay, finally, uh, describe gathering process. What is gathering? It's like gathering, right? But it's gathering, gather. Apa gather? What is gathering? Sha, what is gathering? Shahira. Anyone else? What is gathering? <clears throat> remove harmful impurities from active regions. Yes, very good. Okay, remove harmful impurities from active regions. Okay, how do we do that? How do we do that? What is involved? High temperature, right? Migration of impurities to the to the non-active region, <clears throat> just like uh, the video that I showed yesterday. So where the impurities will be migrating into the non-active area, 
uh, during the fusion process, which is PSG, <clears throat> uh, phosphosilicate glass, which is later removed by uh, HF dip. Okay, so they can remove uh, silicon dioxide. So this one is <clears throat> part of it. Okay, then you're gonna remove the impurities from the process. Okay, let's move on. Uh, so our preparation, our wafer preparation is done. <clears throat> now we need to characterize the wafers that we have produced. So we need to know the properties of the wafers that's that's coming into the wafer fat. So usually, kalau uh, dalam <clears throat> wafer fat last time, uh, if I could recall it correctly, this is done by QA uh, engineers. Uh, if I'm not if I'm not wrong, then it's called SQE. <clears throat> Dalam QA dia ada this this job kan. Ni dekat Siltera lah. It may not work in all fabs. But generally it's done by QA. So dalam QA tu dia ada SQE. SQE is called Supplier Quality Engineering. Dalam group tu lah. It's called, uh, it's called one group SQE. Supplier Quality Engineering. So when I talk about suppliers... <clears throat> so these cover this covers uh, wafers, uh, chemicals, uh, gases, apa saja yang yang perlu disupply oleh supplier to our wafer fab before it can before we can actually run uh, the processes associated with these chemicals, gases, wafers. So <clears throat> so it's done by SQE or supplier quality uh, engineers. Okay. So salah satu uh, what I call product yang or incoming materials yang uh, wafer fab has to look at is the quality of the wafers. So now we are going to look at wafer characterization. What sort of parameters do we have to look at before they qualify our process? Right? There are a few parameters, few quality that uh, that we are looking into, but this is not all. This is only little of them a very little of this long list physical dimension flatness micro roughness oxygen content crystal defects particles uh, resistivity and so much more actually but this only you know uh among the parameters that we are we are looking at okay so we have a couple of uh, techniques that we can do to to characterize wafers well normally when it, when you look at the quality of the incoming wafers <clears throat> there'll usually be uh we call a, a data sheet or something that, that summarizes the quality of the incoming wafers uh like all those parameters you have seen on the previous pages now uh, roughness and oxygen level and defects and uh, particle count and whatever. So they are usually summarized in one document uh, along with the incoming wafers. So these parameters have to be scrutinized by the by the SQE SQE team to make sure that they eligible for the fabrication process. So <clears throat> when we talk about wafer characterization, um, there are many areas. So there are many areas that we are looking at. Uh, it can be optical properties of the wafers. It can be uh, surface morphological properties or surface condition of the wafers. It can be electrical properties. Uh, it can be, yeah, some other properties as well. So it depends on how how do we want to look at it. Okay. So <clears throat> if you look at uh, wafer surface characterization, there are in fact many methods. That can be done to be able to characterize uh, the surface condition of the wafers. So the simplest one is optical microscope, where you put your your wafers under the scope, optical microscope. Uh, use a visible light to actually uh, see what's going on on the surface, whether the surface is clean or you know, uh, there are particles on it or there are some unwanted. Uh, uh, impurities on the surface so it's quite straightforward so in fact uh, when you talk about fabrication processes later on as we go into processes uh, 
optical microscope is also being used. And this step is usually, usually called visual inspection or VI. Normally we call it wave effect. VI is, a, is one step that we need to do along the fabrication process. And in fact, before we actually run the first process. So just, we just go send away first under the scope and then see the certification, maybe a couple of areas on the wafer surface and make sure they are all okay. Then only uh, they pass the, the step. Okay, so it's called visual inspection. There's also another, <clears throat> another condition or another characterization used by uh, the engineers to characterize morphology of the wafers. So this is, I think this is hardly done by wafer fat because normally the incoming wafer surface roughness is very smooth. If you recall the, the table that we discussed yesterday, the order of surface roughness RMS or root mean square is somewhere 0 0.1, 0 0.2 nanometer, which is super smooth. So in that condition, you won't be able to see any any morphology or any roughness on this so it'll just be perfectly flat so you'll probably you, you'll you, you won't see something like this because this one is considered rough if you look at this particular slide <clears throat> the y-axis there is quite is quite high so that means roughness is high as well so this is usually not a uh, wafers for uh, fabrication process or wafer fabrication for IC fabrication in particular. But if you want to fabricate <clears throat> uh, solar cells in particular, you want the surface to be very rough. So you might want them to have something like this, some structures, or some in fact have pyramids. So for some reason, particularly to, to, to reduce the light reflection from the surface and to harvest more photons from the incoming light, from the incident light, in order for us to uh, generate higher photocurrent from the surface. But this is not happening in IC fabrication because you want a surface to be perfectly smooth uh, throughout the fabrication uh, process. Okay. So uh, SEM is another, <clears throat> another dominant method that we normally do in characterizing uh, wafer surface. Um, normally, it it's not done when when surface is smooth because you won't be able to see anything at all. It'll, it'll just be a perfectly smooth surface. But the moment you've got the structures, for example, along the way later on, when we, <clears throat> when we see, when we already have a gate, for example, say if this one is your silicon, and you have a gate aux here, get aux so then you have a gate on top if you have source drain uh, then if you already have this sort of structure then you might be able to see <coughs> uh, under SEM from top view from cross section or from the you know uh, imagine is if this is your gate then you can either view the SEM from top we call it top view you can also view that structure the gate from side or we call it cross section or we call it cross X SEM. That means cross section SEM. So it can also be done as well. <clears throat> so, but if you don't have any structures on the wafer, then you will not see anything. So <clears throat> that's why it's not used when the when we have the incoming wafers because nothing is expected to be on the surface unless unless uh, the quality of the incoming wafers are not good and the surface is not super smooth then you might have to send uh, some of the wafers to to FA or liability FA lab usually the kind of fact that the FA lab failure analysis lab okay so this is where you do all the failure analysis either it's due to defects or the quality of the incoming wafers or incoming whatever so it can be done by FA lab in with a so, uh, <clears throat> just actually, what do you see down? There? What do you see here in this picture? So let me change to red so that you can see clearly. What do you see here in this picture? In a purple.
Anyone? Nampak apa tu? Senang je kan? <coughs> That's not wafer right? Izian, what do you see Izian? Dalam gambar tu? <coughs> Izian? Ah, insects. Moth? Yes, moth. Apa moth tu? Butterfly, is it? Moth? Butterfly, maybe? <clears throat> so, what do you think is the relationship between picture dengan gambar belah kanan ni? Gambar ACM tu. Try to guess. Let's go out of wafer now for a while. <clears throat> Tengok gambar moth tu. Insect or moth or butterfly. Apa kena dengan gambar belah kanan ni? How are they related? Butter, butterfly's vision? Okay, close. Ada lagi? Kita main teka-teka, teka-teki sekejap hari Jumaat ni. Before we move on. So, it's, it's related to wafer characterization. It's related to surface characterization but not on wafer. <coughs> Sebenarnya gambar belah kanan tu is mata dia. Mata moth tu. So if you look at the scale there, you think about SEM, that's, that is SEM image by the way. So it's, it's captured from an angle, I think somewhere 30, 45 degrees from the surface, color of the surface, like this. So it's coming probably from this angle, so it's about 30 to 45. <clears throat> so matter moth though, so it looks like that. So if you look at the scale in the SEM, that's like what, 100 micron. So, so this is just one example. If you if you zoom into the moth punya mata, moth eye, so so the eyes are actually made of nanostructures. So dalam image ni mungkin scale bar is not nano lah. Tapi kalau you zoom in into moth punya mata, it's actually made of nanostructures. So why do you think moth eye is made of nanostructures? Why is it that way? How do I know? How do I know? Agak-agak lah. Just, just give your guess based on based on your physics knowledge. Before we move on. Agak-agak sebab apa dia punya <coughs> mata dia is made of nanostructures. It's related to vision. It's related to optics. Anyone? Bila, okay, let me give you the answer. Nanti you explore yourself. <clears throat> it's going to be related to to optoelectronic devices as well. So, maksudnya, apa yang kita nak create dalam dalam dunia ni, <clears throat> or industry and everything. So, the inspiration is already given by the nature. So, so our God has created our nature to be an inspiration to us. Okay, kalau if you look into moth eye, so the eye is formed by nanostructures. So nanostructure ni, the role is to minimize reflection from the eye. So bila dia minimize reflection, so dia punya, what you call, the prey, the prey, pemangsa dia, tak akan nampak dia lah because dia boleh camouflage a lot easier. Okay, dia boleh camouflage a lot easier, especially night time ataupun low light condition. Kalau tak, tak terang langsung ala cahaya, kalau broad daylight, probably you can see because it's too colourful, right? And too attracting as well. So, <clears throat> so the moment you have nanostructures on the surface, so what it does is actually is, it, it helps to reduce reflection to some extent. And uh, untuk nature, untuk moth macam ni, dia akan protect the moth from, from being attacked by the prey. Okay, so this... Uh, I call this uh, inspiration. This inspiration from the nature has actually given you know some hints or some ideas to to uh, solar cell scientists, solar cell researchers, and some other optoelectronic researchers as well to adopt into solar cells and detectors maybe. So, so one of the you know one of the use usage of this structure is you can actually embed or create 
this structure on your solar cells to do the very same job, which is to minimize reflection. And then bila kita minimize reflection from the surface, so kita akan harvest more light and then we'll, we'll produce more uh, higher photocurrent from the from the solar cell. So in fact, this this was my uh, part of my PhD. So saya punya one of my uh, PhD thesis was on uh, moth eye anti reflection layer. So it's called moth eye AR layer anti reflective coating, where where I use um, moth eye nanostructured surface on plastic substrate, on polyethylene substrate, and just paste on on the surface of solar cell, and then bingo, the reflection goes down. And the photocurrent goes up, efficiency improving. Okay, efficiency improve accordingly due to this uh, thing. So it's part of the uh, surface characterization as well. It's just that it's not on wafer. So if you want to do this on wafer, you can actually do if the wafer is being used for solar cells or uh, light sensitive devices, which requires to minimize reflection and absorbs more light to produce uh, better sensitivity or more current or whatever. whatever. So that is surface characterization. Uh, okay, next. <clears throat> uh, another surface characterization is called, okay, it's called a particle detection by light scattering. So, kalau you get to work on uh, any, you know, any issues in wafer fab, or you dapat join intern in wafer fab, <clears throat> uh, this is one of the, Characterization being used by wafer fab to to check particle on the surface. So particles in wafer fab is very very crucial. So so we we'll learn more on defects later on. There are thousands type thousand types of defect in in um, wafer fab. So some defects you need to have only one of the defects to be able to kill the whole device. So some defects can be tolerated up to a couple of counts. Some defect color is hard to count and the whole device is already gone. So it's very, very sensitive. So therefore the, you know, the particle detection by light scattering to be able to characterize the surface cleanliness of the wafer is very important. Okay. So you can see contamination, you can see hot spot, you can see particles, you can see a uh, streak of chemicals, you can see more things. Okay. So uh, normally it's done by defect inspection machine. Uh, the the most common one last time that we use is, is KLA Tenko. KLA Tenko is the supplier supplier of the machine. So there are so many versions of KLA Tenko's uh, defect inspection tool. So it ranges from SEM base or visible light or scope. So many characterization <clears throat> equipments uh, available to do the defect inspection in wafer fab. And for this particular uh, purpose, KLT is one of the most common one. Okay. If you talk about uh, electrical characterization, we can use many methods. <clears throat> it can be as simple as four point probe, like this one. I don't know if any of you have a four point probe in your FYP ke, previous project or something. Anyone has ever used four point probe? No. <clears throat> okay, four point probe. Why do we call it four point probe? Because we have four points. Kita ada empat pin. Empat how many? How many? Empat. Empat pin. So what's gonna happen is we gonna. This is the wafer. So okay, four. So we have four pins all together. So it touch the surface of the wafer to do the measurement. So what it does is actually it will pass through current and then it will measure uh, the voltage across. So two pins or two probes are for current and two probes are for voltage measurement. So what you can get from the four point probe measurement is a resistivity of the surface of the wafer or shear resistance of the wafer. So you can then compare with uh, the values of the resistance or the resistivity given by the supplier uh, in you know in a data sheet okay so you can always verify the the resistivity or concentration from the wafer surface 
So from, if you recall 386, last time we learned that if you know the resistivity, you can go to the curve of resistivity against the open concentration, and then you can, you can translate the resistivity into the actual concentration uh, in the wafer. So this one is the, one of the simplest measurement that you can do. So that's how it works. So rho there, rho is the resistivity is given by V over I, <clears throat> a voltage measured over current uh, pass through times uh, four pi S. So the values normally is in ohm cm. So the typical one is like one ohm cm, two ohm cm, which usually corresponds to 1.5 time E16 uh, per centimeter cube. So, well, it actually depends on what type of adobe you need for your fabrication process. So some devices might need 1017, some might need 1016, some might need even lower than 15. So it really depends on uh, what sort of devices are we, are we fabricating there, right? Method, uh, a slightly more complicated, it's called Hall Effect. Anyone play on pocket Hall Effect, Sublumni? The cat, uh, no lab? At the point of collapse. Anyone use Hall Effect? Hall Effect. We learned Hall Effect, right? In 36, remember last time? The vendor Pau method. Okay. So it can determine material type. So you don't know if you have a silicon wafer, you don't know whether it's P-type or N-type, you can go to Hall Effect and do the measurement. So what you need to have is a wafer, is a wafer piece, and then you need to have four point contacts. We've covered this one last time, right? A wafer. So round wafer there, you don't know it's P-type or N-type, so you need to you need to have a four contacts at the very edge, close to the edge of the wafer. So it can be, you know, it can be silver or aluminium. So it has to be ohmic in nature. So kita ada short key in ohmic kan? Kita ada tu kan? So it has to be ohmic for it to be measured. So on the wafer, then you can go for hot measurement. Then it, it can tell you whether the silicon is P-type or N-type. And then what's the carrier concentration in the wafer carry mobility, uh, wafer resistivity, uh, sheet resistance, so on and so forth. Okay, it's a very powerful uh, technique that you can use to electrically characterize your wafer. Okay, so you can measure sheet resistance, identify dope P or N, or in fact, if it is intrinsic, then you'll probably see the resistance very high in the range of mega ohm because, because there's no dope to begin with, <clears throat> unless the wafer resistivity is low enough for for the measurement. Okay, so you can revisit your you know the method on how do we use Hall effect, what it tells. So it's called Van der Pau method. It needs four contacts. So this is my example just now. So it has to be four. So the sample can be square, round shape. Well, normally it's round or round or square normally right so you put your uh, aluminum or silver contacts at the very edge of the of the sample to be able to get an accurate measurement so uh, this measurement will tell you either the hall voltage is positive so if it's positive then it's p type if it's negative then it's n type okay so it's decided Hall voltage. Okay, another uh, characterization method available is called FTIR. Anyone use FTIR? Fourier transform red spectroscopy. You can measure transmission, you can measure absorption, you can also measure reflection in the infrared region. Kalau you, you work on something in the infrared region, you are interested to look into the you know absorption or reflection transmission, you can always go to FTIR to check to check. Um, so this is the setup of the FTIR. So it works in the infrared region. So this is one 
example of transmission data that you'll see. Okay. Uh, the wave number is given by centimeter minus one. So it can you can check for you NIR, uh, uh, infrared, far infrared. Okay, any, uh, okay, the next one uh, for surface characterization for impact for crystalline quality uh, verification is called TM. Maybe tak boleh tak pernah pakai kot TM. TM is, is a more advanced version if you compare to SEM. SEM pun dah advanced. TM you can point that to uh, particle punya level. Ada any one of you pernah buat quantum dot sebelum ni? Quantum dot FYP, ada? Tak ada? Not from this group, maybe. So you can check uh, if you if you work on quantum dots, for example, you can actually measure the size of the dot. SEM, uh, well, usually you can go down to around hundred nano or slightly less hundred nano at best. Uh, kalau kita punya dalam dalam no lab tool, typically you can go uh, slightly below 100 and then it will lose its resolution already so that means you cannot see your your surface or your particles clearly because it's going to lose resolution at a very uh, low size tapi if you go for low size yang mana SM tak dapat capture you can go to the app okay, you, you can pinpoint the diameter of your dots maybe of your particles down to 1, 2 and on very very powerful that's how it looks like uh you can see the you know configuration of the dm you can also see the difference between tm configuration and sem sem is a bit simpler there so you need to have electron gun if you talk about tm you need to have electron gun condenser lens aperture another lens objective lens another aperture another lens another lens another aperture and then you can see a final image so in comparison to SEM, you just have to have a gun same uh, to produce the electron, electron beam, and your uh, aperture lens is a lot simpler there in comparison to TM. So that's why the the, the sample uh, to be characterized on TM is a lot more powerful. So this is another representation of the TM, electron gun, condenser lens, uh, objective lens projector but this one's a lot more you know simplified okay simplified so if you look at the configuration there on the left the, de the description uh current around 30 ampere uh, beam voltage is very high 40 kv you can go up to 1 mv resolution 1 to 2 amps uh trans it is based on transmitted electrons uh that means if you want to characterize your sample based on transmitted electrons through the sample, so you need to have a very thin sample. It can be penetrated by the beam and then it can be characterized uh, by the system. Okay. But that is not required when you talk about SEM. So you just can go and characterize the surface of your sample by SEM. But if you talk about TM, uh, you need to thin your sample down to a certain level to be able to characterize, to be characterized by TM. You can also see um, the atomic resolution down there. You can see by HRTM. So TM pun ada dual version. Eh? TM yang biasa dan HR. HR is high resolution TM. So it can in fact give you the crystalline orientation of the particles that you are seeing under TM. So down to that. So this is one example of uh, kind of particles uh, viewed under TM. So if you can see the scale bar there is somewhere 50, 50 nanometer, the scale bar, left to right. So if you look at the size of particles. So what's the average size there do you see? From your eyes, what's the average? If you don't plot a curve or measure every single particle. So what do you, what do you think is the diameter of the particles there? 
Anyone? Look at the skill and then skill accordingly. I think I'll open your skill in viewing particle size with your naked eyes. Proper size? Question four, right? Just give a guess. I think Natasha, what's the particle size there? Average. Based on your eyes. And you know, for zero ten, okay, for zero ten, ten ilham, okay, pretty much eight to ten. Five. So if you divide the scale bar by five, ni very rough, eh? Ni error banyak, eh? Meter ni. Maybe, I don't know, somewhere there. Yeah, maybe around ten, fifteen, maybe, right? So somewhere there. So it's not accurate, of course. But if you want to characterize every single size, it can be done by TM. You can actually go and measure this. You can also go measure this. You can measure, yeah, the more you measure, the more samples you have, the more accurate is your average because your number of N is high. So your average will be more accurate. So from these measurements by TM, you can come up with a histogram of uh, size, if you like, on the x-axis versus fraction of the particle having that size. Fraction is normally the percentage. So they'll, they'll, they'll probably end up with some sort of distribution usually. If you think of the general, normally they'll plot something like this. So, so those are your bar charts, nickel bar chart. So that's a distribution. This is probably your average size. If you say it's, it's 12, for example, then 12 is the center. And it may range down to, I don't know, 8 to 16, maybe. Something like that. So it depends whether the distribution is perfectly symmetrical or slightly skewed. Normally, it won't be symmetrical because it's random in nature. It depends on how do you actually synthesize the particles in the first place. So if it's random, so it'll probably have some sort of distribution, not symmetrical, slightly skewed side maybe, right? But that's the idea of characterizing the particles under uh, TM. So this is not done in wafer because normally we don't put nanoparticles on the wafer just yet, unless, unless, the, the new technologies, uh, maybe, I don't know, biosensor or something, which might require incorporation of nanoparticles on the device to be able to improve the sensing capability, maybe. So for your information, it's now venturing into biosensing as well. So it looks like it's a wafer fab, semiconductor, physics, materials, but they are actually hiring bio graduate as well, biology being graduate, huh? Ada, huh? hired by Sultera to do all the fabrication process. So it's not, 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 you know, it's not fixed for physics or material or EE. So it depends on what the company is doing and what they want. So if you talk about biosensing, then, then they, they'll also need bio graduates to do on the bio side and then, you know, physics, material or EE or some other uh, discipline might come in for the fabrication so end up they join together as one one technology. Okay. Remember the biograduate and Hayat Basitera uh, lately. I heard I heard of that as well to do all the biosensing work. Okay. TM. Okay, if you talk about uh, the difference between SEM versus TM, what do you think would be the glaring difference between uh, the image of SEM versus TM. Just list down what do you think is the main difference. So we have seen the capabilities, we have seen the configuration. So what do you think is the dif main difference? If you, if you need to highlight three points, so what would the three points be in terms of the differences between TM and SEM? Come on, tell me three points. You're almost done. Upper bezel SEM and TM. The glaring one, yang paling yang paling obvious lah. Anything?
Apa beza? Apa beza? Just give me the keywords. Nabila. Nabila, what's the obvious difference between SEM and TM? Come on, three points. Then we're going to be done. Done for this week. Surface done internal interface. Oh, sorry. Surface and internal surface. Well, what do you mean, Shah? Surface and internal surface. Surface of the sample. Elaborate a little bit on that. Don't be there. Anybody else at the bar? Thickness of the sample. Okay, which one has to be thinner? Farah? SEM or TM? SEM, sample surface, TM, detail in the. Ah, oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Got you now. Uh, SEM characterizes characterizes sample surface. TEM characterizes uh, the detailed internal composition of the sample. Okay. Yep. Farah Azwani, uh, TM is thinner, right? It has to be thinner because uh, the mechanism is by transmission, right? That's why we call it transmission electron microscope. So the electrons have to trans have it have to be transmitted through the sample. Therefore, the samples have to be thin enough for the beam to be transmitted through and characterized. Okay, TM has higher resolution. Yes, good. One more, last one. TM has higher resolution. Therefore, it can characterize smaller size of your samples or particles or topology. Last one. How about the there? How about cost? Tak ada mana lagi murah, mana lagi mahal. Straight forward, right? Yang mana lagi mahal? TM mahal guys, TM lah kan, TM lah, TM lagi mahal kan. Kalau TM lagi canggih, lagi canggih mahal lah. SEM scattered electron, uh, TM transmitted electron, TM uh, yep, very good. So TM lagi mahal. Kalau you, kalau you go, kalau you bring your sample for characterization dekat lab, for example, um, for SEM, you might get, I don't know, 150 to $200 untuk characterize satu sample. For TM, you might, you might be charged 400, 500 per sample. So it'll be kurang double lah at least. So that shows the, you know, the cost of the equipment itself, right? Maintenance, don't talk about maintenance. Maintenance is a lot more uh, costly. Okay, done. SEM, TEM. Anything you would like to ask on characterization? We have thousands of characterization methods of the, of the wafers. So this is only, you know, if you go back to this page, this is only simplistic uh, representation of the quality measures of the wafers. Banyak lagi ya, XRF, XRD, if you have to, XRD is not that common for wafers. XRF is more common to, uh, to, to investigate how much of iron, copper, or uh, other metal contaminants do you have on the surface, especially when you run uh, some technologies like, uh, if I may share, uh, copper, nanti kita akan tengok copper damascene technology so last time Siltera ran C13 technology, we call it C13 is copper based copper ni dia contaminant dalam silicon if you revisit your 386 you will see that copper is a is a lifetime killer for carriers dalam device so but this particular technology it requires copper to be part of the, the whole fabrication process so therefore, you macam Purposely masukkan copper dalam silicon uh, when you know that copper is time killer. So therefore, 
copper has to be controlled very, very strictly and accurately. So, so this can be characterized last time, Siltera used XRF, X-ray fluorescence to characterize how much copper is left uh, on the surface before the actual fabrication can be run. Many more, there are the SPV, as I mentioned SPV, because it's surface photovoltage. Become photovoltaic, eh? Voltage. Voltage, eh? A voltan, eh? Surface photovoltage. SPV. Ini pun nak characterize um, surface condition juga. There are many more uh, for optical inspection. Lycan is a brand name. Into optical inspection, pakai microscope is normally by Lyca. Uh, what else? Characterization. Many more. So if you if you are in Osram, then you might be looking at optics. Uh, if you are in Sultra, maybe a bit less of optics, more on the surface. Uh, more on electrical. Electrical is quite common across semiconductor. So uh, what sort of characterization do you need actually depends on which industry you are in. Either you are in opto or you are in solar, you are, you are in uh, IC or you are in yeah, some other devices. So, so that will actually determine what sort of characterizations do you need to do on your incoming wafers or substrate glass or suffice or some other substrate as well. Okay. Okay, any, uh, any questions on this uh, characterization? We are done with preparation, we're done with characterization. Sekarang, uh, next we're going to look at, next week, we're going to look at how do we use the incoming wafers for the process. Ada soalan ke? For this particular topic, saya tak sempat cover semua, so this is just the G's, if you like, the essence of what needs to be characterized, but there are many more, you can find out there. Ada soalan ya? Eh? So at least from this, it, you have some ideas that we, we we do characterize optics by optical method. Uh, for example, talk about optics and normally we use spectrophotometer, UV visible infrared spectrophotometer. This one is for optical characterization. Uh, so you know that there are also electrical character characterization which can be done by IV measurement. Hall effect, four point probe is the simplest. Uh, if you if you work in uh, Fuji Electric, if you if you get to work to do with hard disk fabrication, uh, HD, HDD, yeah, hard disk drive, HDD industry. So you need to do a lot of characterizations on magnetic. So idea based on magnetic properties, huh? So dulu when I was in Fuji Electric, I I get to do a lot of uh, HDD magnetic characterization like VSM. You can have a look at this. Into magnetic properties. Uh, magnetic, uh, banyak lagi ya, many more. Eh? Uh, so magnetic, optical, surface morphology, electrical, optical. Uh, yeah, it really depends on uh, which type of industry you're in. Okay, done. So I believe no questions because nobody says and there. So next, uh, next week, inshallah, we're going to look at clean room. Okay, clean room. Kita akan tengok clean room first. Clean room is the space that you need to be able to do fabrication processes. So without clean room, I will buy any fabrication processes because the room will not be clean enough for you to do. There will be particles. So you're going to see later on. When you talk about clean room, what is clean room? What does it take to be a clean room? So what sort of uh, parameters do we monitor in a typical clean room? Uh, what are the do's and don'ts in a clean room? We'll see later on next week, inshallah. So no questions then, that's for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow then, tomorrow's weekend. Have a great weekend to all of you. So I'll see you again Monday, inshallah. Assalamualaikum, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Don't go outside if you don't have to.